Welcome to the Forest Park Seventh-day Adventist Church, a vibrant, diverse, growing, and friendly community of faith located in Everett, Washington, blending traditional and contemporary elements to create a weekly opportunity to worship our Creator God. Now, please find a quiet and comfortable place to sit and enjoy this worship hour with the Forest Park Seventh-day Adventist Church. Good morning, everyone. It is a privilege to be here, and it's a little bit strange to be starting church in the baptistry. But for all of you who are viewing online, thank you for being patient with us. Not only are, have we canceled church except for the stream because of our snowstorm, but we also have a baptism to celebrate today. And so you're going to have to bear with us as there are very few participants here today, and we're going to have to change our clothes and things like that. Well, I would like to introduce our congregation to Phineas and Kelvin Ruji. Wave your hands, guys. <laughs> uh, they have been uh, in preparation for baptism actually for quite some time. Pastor Lyle had planned on baptizing you guys before his retirement and before the pandemic. And then we had the pandemic and he retired. And so you weren't able to get baptized at that time. So it's been my great privilege to come alongside you guys to kind of pick up where Pastor Lyle left off in your studies. And I believe, as I know you believe, you guys are ready to be baptized, to give your lives publicly to Jesus Christ. Now that's something to celebrate. Um, as is always the case, I always ask baptismal candidates three questions. So you guys get the same three questions. The first question, and make sure you answer nice and loud so this microphone will pick up your answer. Do you love Jesus with all of your heart and trust in him for your salvation? I do. I do. You do. All right. And do you understand and accept the teachings of the Seventh-day Adventist Church as we have talked about? Yes. Yes. And is it your desire to be a member of this local congregation? Yes. Yes. All right. Well, I do have to say that baptizing young people like yourself is one of the greatest privileges that a pastor ever has. So I'm going to invite you guys to bow your heads with me for a word of prayer, and then we'll get wet, okay? Dear Jesus, we come before you, and I would like to give you thanks and praise and glory for Phineas and for Kelvin and for their decision to follow you today. Lord, I'm so thrilled that they desire to give their lives to you, to dedicate themselves publicly. I'm so glad that family could be here from out of town and that they made it safely here to the church, even with all the snow. Lord, I pray that you would send your Holy Spirit and anoint them, that you would show them the ministry that you have in their lives, that you would stay very close to them. And no matter what temptation Satan throws at them, that you would provide them a way of escape, make it very clear Give them the courage to walk through that way of escape. Lord, I pray that their lives would be filled with many meaningful moments spent with you, opportunities to serve you, and the joy that is ours through salvation. And so now, Lord, as we obey you by participating in this rite of baptism, as so many in Scripture and all those Christians before us have done, I pray that this moment would stand out as a very special moment in their lives, a time when they were closer to you than ever before. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, Kelvin, you're closest to me, so we're going to go first with you. All right. So, have you positioned you here just like that? Kelvin, as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, it is my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right, Phineas. Grab your wrist. There you go. Phineas, as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, it is my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 
Amen. Well, we'll be out in just a moment. See you there. Welcome and happy Sabbath, everyone. We're doing things a little bit different today. Uh, as you all know, the local weather here in Everett, so we got a pretty big snowstorm here, and uh, we decided to just do the, the live stream only for church service today. But it's been a, a beautiful day. It's uh, snowy, white, and pure. It's a perfect day for the baptism of Kelvin and Phineas. And uh, we're glad to be able to move forward with this beautiful baptism in this time. We'll be doing things a little bit different today. As you can tell, we had the uh, baptism right up front. And uh, we have a shortage of some piano and organ, but uh, still going to be a fantastic Sabbath day. Just a few announcements we had. Uh, we just, like always, and if you uh, decide to come into church services for each Sabbath, we have a limit of 50 people. We'd like you to call in on Thursday ahead of time just to let Kathy know some way or another. You can email her or call in. And also on Wednesdays, we got uh, Bible studies, prayer and Bible study on Wednesdays. And, and also we have Sabbath schools, Sabbath school class on uh, Sabbath at 9 a.m. And uh, we just want to thanks everybody for joining us on the live stream here. We have some, you know, of course, on the bulletin, we got prayer requests. We have many prayer requests for health. And uh, there's a number of people here, Phyllis Franks and Lynn Ellis, of course. Steve and Linda McMullen, Ray and Phyllis Rank. Brent Massengale and Ann Ross, and also many prayers for comfort during this last year with the Marilyn Jordan family, the Harshenko family and friends, especially Shirley during this time, and Kathy Mayer and uh, Marcus Mayer and their friends and family, and friends and family of Christine Machinika and Gordon Scheider family and their friends also, dear father. At this time, we're going to have a scripture reading. The scripture reading is Luke 4, verses 19, 18 and 19, from the New King James Version. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to, treat, to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. At this time, you will find a, a position of reverence, and we will kneel and have prayer. Dear Holy and Heavenly Father, we thank you for this holy Sabbath day, dear Father, and for keeping us safe in our homes during this time of snow. And it's beautiful, but can be sometimes treacherous, dear Father. I thank you for those who are able to attend and how we are able to live stream this, this message to our church family and to celebrate this baptism today, dear Father. Thank you for the freedom we have here every Sabbath day to worship you, to come closer to you during this time of unprecedented change, dear Father. We pray that your spirit to continue to bless this church. We thank you for, for this church family. It's such a diverse, amazing church family, dear Father. And we thank you for the church school and uh, how you blessed us this year with a nice full attendance, dear Father, and we thank you for your love, your patience with us during this time. Help us to be loving and kind to everyone we meet and to lean on you first is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.
At this time, I'd like to invite Delphina to come up and share her talents with us. God is good. And all the time, uh, I'm going to sing It Is Well With My Soul, but I'll be singing it in Swahili, so I hope you enjoy. Ni o na po a ma ni ka a ma shua ri a ha u ni o na po shi da kwa ha li zo te u me ni ju li sha di salam ro ho ni mong hu e ti su e ti su e with my soul with my soul e Tis well, it is well with my soul. Dambi zangu zote wala hasi nusu uwe kwa. Msa la bahani wahala si chukui la ha na yake di salam rohoni mangu. It is well, it is well with my soul, with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. In God. Oh, shetani ata ani tesa nihita jipa moyo wani Kristo amehona. Unyo ke wahangu en ahas shed his own blood for my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. With my soul, it is well, it is well with my And we're back, just like that. So, left hand, Phineas. There we go, Kelvin. So, in there, you will find your baptismal certificate, as well as a journal and the book, Steps to Christ. So, I hope that those will be a blessing to you in your spiritual walk. Now, we've already asked the questions. 
We've already done the baptism, but at this point, it is now customary for us to officially vote you into membership. So, since there is no specification about how many people have to be in church in order to make this vote happen, we are going to do this with the limited number of people we have right here. So is there a motion to accept these two young gentlemen into church membership? Motion, and as, we'll take that as a second. So all in favor, wave your hands. All right, you see all those hands waving? They represent the entire congregation. So you are officially here. That's right. That is right. All right. We are so thrilled to have you guys as a part of our church congregation here. Now, I understand you have a special music to play for us. Is that correct? All right. So I'm going to just let you guys head on over to the piano and take it away. Good morning again. So grateful to have each person here, albeit via live stream. It feels like we just went back in time to when church was actually closed, except for when we could only have just the people putting on the production. I believe Governor Inslee limited that number to about 10 people, and when I was out in Port Angeles for about three and a half months, that is literally all we had in the congregation, is just about 10 people to produce church and no one else. So it feels like we've gone back in time, but this time it has nothing to do with the pandemic, praise God, and everything to do with the snow that's outside. So I invite you, please bow your heads with me for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask that your spirit would be in this place as we feel rushed this morning, at least I have, worrying about the snow and who can come and who can't and how we'll change things. Lord, I pray that you would bring your spirit into my heart, into my words, into the hearts and lives of those who will listen. I pray that you would bring calm and the ability to communicate and to understand. Speak through me today, dear Jesus, in your name. Amen. The old adage states that familiarity breeds contempt. Familiarity breeds contempt. Now, as is often the case with something like that, there is often quite a significance of this uh, sort of thing. People who've been around one another for quite a long time 
start to get very annoyed and even contemptuous with each other. But is it familiarity that breeds contempt, or is there just simply a correlation? Is it familiarity that is causative in this case? Now, Psychology Today recently published an article that, with the title, Does Familiarity Really Breed Contempt? And the argument in that article was that no, in fact, familiarity does not breed contempt. So what does breed contempt? Things like dishonesty, disloyalty, dishonor, distrust. These things compounded over time in a relationship where people are close together breeds contempt. When there's a person who has a me-first attitude in everything that they do, there can be no intimacy. And the fact that people are geographically very close together, in close proximity with a me-first attitude, often leads to distrust and dishonor and disrespect. And that breeds contempt. Because there's many occurrences where people live together, married couples, for years and years and years, and they don't hate each other. How can we explain this? Familiarity is, in fact, not the thing that breeds contempt. Jesus grew up in the city of Nazareth, and after His baptism, He went out into the wilderness for 40 days, and there He was tempted by Satan. And after those 40 days, the Holy Spirit came upon him in power, and he went throughout the region of Galilee and preached the gospel and performed many miracles. The miracle at the wedding at Cana of water to wine had been performed by this time. He had gone to Capernaum by the sea, and he had preached the gospel powerfully there. He had healed many, many sick people, and he came home to his hometown of Nazareth. We're in Luke chapter 4 this morning. Luke chapter 4 tells us that Jesus had gone throughout the entire region of Galilee, and his fame was growing. Uh, Luke chapter 4 verse 14, then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and news of him went throughout all the surrounding region, and he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. Now, if you know anything about the synagogue, you know that they only gathered at the synagogue for formal teaching like this on the Sabbath. So, clearly, an amount of time had elapsed. Jesus had been going throughout the various synagogues in Galilee and teaching, and He comes home to Nazareth, and the people in Nazareth go, Jesus is here. He's one of us, and He's doing all of these great things. Do you think He'll be at the synagogue on Sabbath to teach us as well? And so, there was a great crowd gathered at the synagogue of Nazareth. Now, in this uh, church structure that they had, they would do several different readings, reading from the law and from the prophets, but it was very typical that if there was a traveling rabbi, a visiting rabbi, the visiting rabbi would read from the prophets and would then give a sermon. That was the traditionally expected thing, and Jesus fit the bill. He was a visiting, now returned home, rabbi. And so they gave him the scroll of Isaiah, and he opened to Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1. Now, we don't know if Jesus chose this passage or if that was the natural reading that was expected for that day in a progression of readings, a sequential... um, Anyway, you know what I'm trying to say here. But either way, Jesus ends up at... Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1. So, I'm going to read what he read, but we're going to read from Luke. Luke chapter 4, and I'm going to start reading in verse 16. So, he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah, and when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. 
He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, I have always thought that this was kind of a short sermon. I'd always kind of wondered about that. It just seemed to me like Jesus just read the Scripture, and then as we'll read in a moment, He said, today this is fulfilled in your hearing, and then everything breaks loose. I'm like, wait a second, that seems kind of short. Well, I was reading in the book Desire of Ages by Ellen White, and she says that in fact, that was the introductory Scripture reading for a much longer sermon. In fact, Jesus expounded at great length about what these things mean. You see, this was a prophecy, as we've already mentioned, that came from Isaiah chapter 61, that was very much applied to the Messiah. These things described the Messiah, who the Messiah was, what He would do. And so, when the people heard this, they went, yes, yes, the Messiah, that's right, our hope the thing we've been waiting for. It's kind of like when a preacher gets up to a Seventh-day Adventist congregation and says, Jesus is coming soon. We go, yes, that's right. We're excited about it. They loved what he had to say. So, let's take a moment and look at what made them so happy. What were they so excited about? He came to preach or to proclaim good news, the gospel to the poor. The Greek word here for preach or proclaim good news is euangelizo, which means to make a joyful declaration. Who is he making this declaration to? To the poor. Yes, we need the declaration of good news for the poor. Amen, Jesus. Hear, hear. <coughs> he came to proclaim liberty to the captives. You'll recall that the people of Israel went into exile. Jerusalem was destroyed, and they were carried off to Babylon. That's when the stories of Daniel came along. In fact, that was the time when Isaiah gave the prophecy, is when they were carried off into exile. And many of these people were carried far and wide. They weren't carried just to Babylon, but they were carried all throughout the Medo-Persian Empire and eventually all throughout the Greco-Roman Empire. It's called the diaspora, the wide dispersion of the Jewish people. Nearly every town that you could go to in the ancient world had a synagogue and had a Jewish population. Why? Because of the diaspora. Because conquering armies came in, they took the people captive and displaced them. And they took them so far away from home and left them so few in number in those respective places they could never gather together and form a revolt. Proclaim liberty to the captives. Who are the captives here? The Greek word literally means prisoners of war. Yes, Jesus, the Messiah will bring us all back together. Hear, hear. Amen. Keep preaching. He will proclaim recovery of sight to the blind. Yes, there are many in our midst who are blind. There are many lepers. There are many who are sick of various things. Jesus not Jesus, the Messiah will be the healer. He will heal us. Hear, hear, Jesus. Amen. Keep preaching. To set at liberty those who are oppressed. Oh, amen, Jesus. You preach, Jesus. These Romans, they'll be out of here. As soon as the Messiah gets here, the Romans will be kicked out. And those of us who are oppressed, we will be free, set at liberty. Keep preaching, Jesus. We like what you have to say. And he will proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, this is a direct reference to the year of Jubilee. In fact, Isaiah chapter 61 seems to be very much focused on the year of Jubilee. Now, you can read about the year of Jubilee in Leviticus chapter 25. The year of Jubilee was the culmination of seven sabbatical years. Now, a sabbatical year was a time when Uh, slaves would be set free and allowed to return home. Debts would be canceled. Every seventh year, if anyone had fallen into debt and had to sell themselves either to a relative or to a neighbor or someone else so that they could pay off the debt, they were only enslaved or in servitude until the sabbatical year. 
In fact, there's even evidence that the Jews were not expected to pay taxes on the sabbatical year because they didn't also farm crops that year. They let their uh, fields lie fallow in the sabbatical year. Now, seven sabbatical years would accumulate, and then came the year of Jubilee, which said that all servants were set free, all debts were remitted, which were part of the sabbatical year, but any land that had been sold to pay for a debt, or for any reason, returned to the family of origin. You could not sell property forever. This was God's way of preventing people from falling into poverty. It's actually a very, very equitable system. But the land returned to the original owner. Jesus says, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, to proclaim the jubilee. Yes, Jesus, there's Romans here, and they possess this land, and we are captives here, and the Messiah will give the land back to us the way it's supposed to be. Hear, hear, preach on, Jesus. But then Jesus did something interesting. He stopped. Have you ever noticed that sometimes the things that are not said are as important or more important than the things that are said? For instance, let's say you have a young budding romance between a couple. We'll say they're college age. Maybe they'd like to get married in a short amount of time, and maybe this person is the one, and they've been seeing each other for a little while, and they have a romantic evening, and you know, a, a nice, quiet, romantic moment, and one of them says, I love you, for the first time, and the other one freezes and doesn't say anything. I like you too. Uh-oh. That's not good, is it? No, that's not good at all. I, I, I thought we loved each other. Ooh, maybe we're having our first fight now. Conflict has been introduced into this relationship. You see, the thing that is not said can be just as important or more important than the thing that is said. Or, for instance, someone does something quite egregious, something bad, and in an attempt to make it right, they may say something like, um, well, I, I've put this back together and... Well, I hope that helps. But if they never mention the words, I'm sorry, then we really wonder about the sincerity, don't we? Because the things that are not said can become as important or more important than the things that are said. What did Jesus not say? Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 61. In Isaiah chapter 61, verse 2, we find a very important omission. So I'll start in verse 1, 61, 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because He has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor, to set me... He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. This is a prophecy about the Messiah. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance about the Messiah. But the thing was, is that the Jews liked to focus on that verse in particular. Oh, vengeance. You see, we're oppressed here by these Romans, and we're going to get them kicked out. When the Messiah gets here, he's going to kick them out, and we'll have vengeance upon them. Oh, that was their favorite part. Now, did Jesus misinterpret the Scripture by quoting it the way he did? No. No. You see, Romans chapter 12, verse 19, as well as Hebrews chapter 10, verse 30 tell us, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. God alone claims the prerogative of vengeance because He alone is able to judge correctly to know when vengeance is warranted. 
You see, we human beings, we tend to get caught up in the slights against ourselves, the hurts that have accumulated, and we tend to overreact when it comes to vengeance. God alone has the ability to properly discern when vengeance is appropriate and when it is inappropriate. God says, vengeance is mine, not yours, mine. Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 11, God says, I take no delight in the destruction of the wicked, meaning it is something that he does very reluctantly when he has no other choice. But what he was trying to do, what Jesus was attempting to do, was to tell them what his mission was as the Messiah. Let's go back to Luke chapter 4. Jesus has now finished reading, and I believe he has given a long sermon, as I understand it. And verse 20 says, Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So all bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? Now wait a second. Isn't this Joseph's son? And he is saying that he's the Messiah? He grew up here. We watched him work. We saw him get the first facial hairs on his face. This is Joseph's son. He can't claim to be the Messiah. We know him. Continuing on, verse 23. And he said to them, You will surely say to me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we have, done, we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in your own country. Then he said, Assuredly, I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you truly, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a great famine throughout all the land. But to none of them was Elijah sent, except to Zarephath in the region of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. So all those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath, and rose up and thrust him out of the city, and they led him to the brow of the hill on which their city was built, that they might throw him down over the cliff. Then, passing through the midst of them, he went his way. Friends, let's come back to where we started. Does familiarity breed contempt, or is it something else? I believe it is something else. You see, Jesus was the Son of God. He was blameless in every possible way. He had committed no sin, and His life was a living, walking, breathing rebuke to the selfishness, the hatred, the jealousy, and the pride of the Jews. Thing is, is they felt no need of the Messiah's mission, at least not the mission that Jesus revealed to them that day. They had already decided in their mind what the Messiah would do for them. They had already decided that the Messiah would kick out the Romans, that He would give back their land, that He would make them rich and powerful and mighty to feed the pride that they had inside of them. But Jesus, in these last words, says, there were many widows in the land of Israel, but the prophet Elijah was not sent to any of them. He was sent to a lowly Sidonian woman, There were many lepers in the land of Israel in the days of of Elisha, but none of them were healed. Only Naaman, a foreigner, was healed. What he's saying is, you are the ones in need of healing. You are the poor. You are the ones 
who are unworthy of receiving the Messiah. You see, when you reject something for long enough, when you reject God's call for long enough, eventually it will turn into hatred and wrath and violence. A person in a state of rejection may not be there yet, but if they progress long enough, they will get there. They will become violent in their hatred against the Messiah. The thing is, is what Jesus said came too close to home for them. His life, again, was a living rebuke. What he was doing is revealing that their hearts were hard, that they were selfish, that they were corrupt, that they were proud. And that had nothing to do with God's mission because God's mission is first and foremost a spiritual mission. God, in the form of Jesus Christ, the true Messiah, came to relieve the spiritual burdens of this world. First and foremost. So let's go back through the list and consider the mission of the Messiah. He says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Who are the poor? In Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, Jesus says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I would propose to you today that the poor are those who sense their need of God. Those who realize they can do nothing without the grace and mercy of God. Those who realize that even if their life looks pretty good, even if it feels pretty good, if they're quite successful in life, when it comes to the things of eternity, they're hopeless without Jesus. These are the poor, and the proud hearts of the Jews could not reconcile Jesus' statements to their expectations. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives. Liberty to the captives. Again, captives in Greek means prisoners of war. In case you haven't noticed, there's a war on. That war is between Jesus and Satan. As Seventh-day Adventists, we call that the great controversy. The cosmic conflict. And human beings, we are the ones who are caught in the crosshairs of that war, the crossfire of that war. We are the ones who, in fact, are prisoners to the curse of sin. And without outside interference, we have no hope. Prisoners of war. The Messiah came to declare, to set at liberty the prisoners of war, those uh, trapped in sin, to proclaim the recovery of sight to the blind, the word blind in Greek is the word tuflos. I always liked that word. It was one of my favorite uh, uh, vocabulary words when I was flipping through the vocabulary cards learning Greek. Tuflos, blind. But if you look at the term tuflos in the New Testament, it is used very interchangeably between spiritual blindness and literal blindness. It is not just a mission to those who are literally blind, but Jesus' mission is to give sight to those who can't see the spiritual realities around them. Those who otherwise are ignorant of the things going on. Jesus came to declare to them, open your eyes and see. The Jews didn't like this either because Jesus implied that they too were blind and they thought they had it all figured out. And to set at liberty those who are oppressed. The term oppressed means bruised or broken in pieces. Bruised or broken in pieces. Not necessarily those who receive injustice, though that certainly could be included, but bruised and broken in pieces. Those who have experienced the brunt of what sin can deal out and are weary of the struggle, are broken down, ready to give up, ready to throw in the towel. Things that come to my mind are people who've been abused, people who struggle with mental health 
mental illness. People who struggle for a long time with physical illness. Soldiers returning home from serving their country with PTSD and nightmares. The bruised and the broken in pieces. These are the ones the Messiah is going to heal, to put back together. He is going to relieve them, give them liberty from this destruction. This is the mission of the Messiah, and the Jews are going, no, 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 we're not oppressed and broken in pieces. We're oppressed by the Romans, but we're strong. We're powerful. And Jesus is saying, no, no, no. You are bruised and broken in pieces. You see, the thing is, Jesus is not just declaring what his mission is, but he's declaring who we are. We all are, in fact, poor. We all are, in fact, blind. We all are, in fact, captives, prisoners of war who have been bruised and broken in pieces. Every single one of us. The difference as to why the Messiah's mission is accomplished for some and not for others is some are willing to recognize that and others are not. Others can't see past the pride of their own heart to what the Messiah's real mission is. You see, he was attacking their sense of national pride as well as their personal sense of pride. It's interesting, Jesus all throughout the Gospels is never in support of a radical nationalism. He's never in support of, I'm from this country, therefore I am great. The only country that we can boast about is our heavenly country. No other country. Now, it's right and natural that we would feel a sense of affinity and pride towards the country of our origin. That's perfectly natural, even acceptable, but never before our allegiance to the heavenly kingdom. And if ever we have pride in one, it ought to be the heavenly kingdom. Jesus is saying, I came here to relieve the entire world of sin and the effects of sin. That is the mission of the Messiah. I read an interesting study recently. Two former Adventist sociologists, last names of Bull and Lockhart, They wrote a book entitled Seeking the Sanctuary, and it's an old book. It's been around for quite some time, and in the last chapter, they describe the revolving door in Adventism, and specifically, they describe the process in which a family comes into the church. That would be the first generation, the children of those who come into the church, the second generation, and then the children of the third generation. Oftentimes, the children in the third generation are the ones who leave the church. Now, the reason being, they posit, now they look at this entirely from a sociologist's perspective. I'm going to describe that to you, and then I'm going to give my pastor's interpretation of the information, okay? So, the first group that comes in is oftentimes socioeconomically quite poor. They don't have a lot going for them. They need money. They need a good job. They don't have a lot of educational background. They truly feel their need of something better. And because they feel such a strong need in a physical sense, in everyday life, their hearts are very open to the gospel message. And the message of Adventism is a very powerful and compelling message. And so they come into the church, and oftentimes their children are sponsored and supported going to Adventist Christian education. They are able to get the, the education that their parents were not able to get. And Adventism being a subculture, I'm speaking specifically to North America, I can't talk outside of North America at all, but here in North America, the subculture of Adventism has the incredible ability of raising people in the socioeconomic status. Why? Because of education. We educate our young people. We're very intentional, even aggressive, about educating our young people. And I don't think that's a wrong thing. I don't think that's bad. Our Adventist universities provide college degrees. They have very high acceptance rates, very high acceptance rates, but they also provide a quality of education on par with many Ivy League schools when it comes to the earning potential of the people who come out of those institutions. The second generation experiences this. 
they make dramatically more money than their parents did. They work in professional settings. They become accountants and lawyers and especially go into the healthcare professions. They make a lot of money and they provide a very comfortable life for their children. The third generation. The third generation never grows up poor. They don't grow up knowing what it's like to have to balance the checkbook before going to the grocery store to find out if there's enough money to eat this next week. They don't know if you'll be able to get the car working again after it broke down because there's no money. They don't know about the stress parents had to get scholarships to go to the education, get education. Because these third generation kids grew up with all of these things because their parents were educated and got a very, very good degree and profession and earned a very good wage. And they grow up without a sense of need. And they too receive that phenomenal education. They go to the schools and earn the degrees and oftentimes follow their parents either in the same profession or in an equal socioeconomic status vocation. Children of physicians oftentimes will become physicians or lawyers or engineers or CEOs. You see what I'm trying to say here. But because they never grew up with this deep sense of need, for some reason it's much more difficult for the gospel to reach deep down into the heart. And it is this third generation primarily that walks out the revolving door. My pastor's interpretation is that because they do not have the socioeconomic need that their parents did, that their grandparents did, it's harder to be open to the gospel. You see, they have lived their lives in a household that was governed by the principles of how God taught us to live our life. And if we live our lives according to those principles, good things result. Live on less than you make. Put money away for retirement. Get a, you know, go and become educated. Learn principles of health so you have longevity and that you don't spend huge amounts of time in healthcare facilities. Eat a good diet. Give generously of your time through service. All of these things have an incredible power to transform the life in a very, very positive way. But the thing I think we have to wrestle with is working with the young people who grow up in that already blessed environment. How do they also sense their need? This is really quite a challenge, I think. But Jesus is declaring to us that every single one of us has a need. Each and every one of us has an incredible spiritual need. We cannot possibly get to heaven on our own. There's no way. But we can go to work. We can earn a very good wage. We're healthy. We're affluent. We're doing a really good job. The pride of the heart begins to come in and to take over. Now, I don't have all the answers here today. I really do not. In fact, my own children are probably in that generation that will grow up quite affluent. So I'll have to really wrestle with this question. But how do we do this? I think taking very seriously what Jesus has said, that each and every one of us is bruised and broken in pieces. I think we need very careful instruction in these matters. In 12-step programs, they say until a person hits rock bottom, they won't really seek a change. I think until we realize that we are sinners and there's absolutely nothing that we can do about it save Jesus Christ, we won't make a change. Now come with me, Luke chapter 4, verse 18, the last phrase, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Jesus has declared, He has proclaimed what His mission is. It is a spiritual mission on behalf of the entire world to relieve them of sin and all of the effects of sin. But then in that last phrase, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Remember, oppressed means bruised and broken in pieces. The term to set is the Greek term apostello. 
It sounds an awful like apostle, an awful lot like apostle, because it comes from the same root. Apostle means to send out or to dispatch on a mission. Embedded right here in the Messiah's mission is the commissioning of all of those who receive the mission. They too are to engage in this mission. Those who are bruised and broken in pieces are to be sent out. They are to be dispatched on a mission to go help the Messiah fulfill His mission. They become co-laborers. It says in Revelation chapter 12, I believe verse 11, that they overcame the dragon. This is the saints. They overcame the dragon, Satan, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. How is it that we overcome? How is it that we progress? It's that we realize how terrible we have it. We allow Jesus to heal it, and then we go and tell others about it. Embedded right here is the term apostello, meaning to send out or to dispatch on a mission. He is going to give liberty to those who are bruised and broken in pieces. He's going to heal them, but he's also going to send them out. He's saying, all of you who listen to the message, the mission that I have, who hear what I have to say, to recognize that I'm speaking about you and you allow me to fulfill my mission on your life, I'm going to join, have you join with me, and I'm going to send you out so that you too can bring my mission to other people. I think That is part of how we work with those who feel no need. You see, if we never engage in labor, spiritual labor, on behalf of those who are lost, it'll be very hard to recognize the need in those around us. I read some statistics a couple weeks ago that Lee Venden had quoted, and he'll be coming here the end of summer for a revival series, the All About Jesus series. I hope you'll mark it on your calendar and plan to be in attendance or to watch via live stream. Better if you're in attendance, (laughs) just saying. (laughs) Better if you're in attendance. But he said that something like 90% of Seventh-day Adventists have never led someone to Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not talking about where you are the only single person who has any influence on this other person who commits to follow Jesus and become baptized. But oftentimes it takes a village to raise someone. There's oftentimes a group of three to six or eight people who have come around a person when they finally come to the point of making the decision to be baptized and giving their heart to the Lord. But the vast majority of Adventists have never experienced that. Is it any wonder If we don't sense a need for ourselves, we're not able to recognize it in others. One of my favorite commentators on the Bible is the late John R.W. Scott, or Stott, excuse me, S-T-O-T-T. He was uh, a Brit. In fact, he's a Scotsman. And he wrote some incredibly powerful commentaries. And he agreed with us on the state of the dead, in fact, which almost got him kicked out of the evangelical world. <laughs> they, had, they even took a vote on whether or not he could be an evangelical because he believed with us on the state of the dead. But the thing that I love about his commentaries the most, the reason I think that they are so powerful, so insightful, is that he never stopped pastoring a local church. He could have been a dean of a seminary easily had a prestigious academic appointment. He had the academic credentials. He certainly had the academic prowess. He published voluminously. But he never stopped pastoring a local church. He preached Sunday after Sunday. He wasn't an Adventist. He preached week after week. And he met with people. He kept office hours. People came in and told him their stories. They told him what was going on in their lives. And as he walked with them, he could see his own need, the challenges in his own life, his own need of the Messiah. Friends, Jesus has proclaimed his mission to us. His mission is for the entire world. It is a spiritual mission. Let me ask Do you you recognize your great need? If we don't recognize our need, 
if we don't feel that we are irrevocably sinful, save the grace of Jesus Christ. We have no hope. And we, like the Jews in the synagogue there in Nazareth, will one day stand up and drive him out and attempt to throw him off of a cliff. But if we do sense our need, oh, the joy that awaits us. Because he is going to heal the brokenhearted. He is going to bind up those who are bruised and broken in pieces. He's going to put us back together. He's going to make it all new. But he's also going to send us out to help find others like how we used to be so that we can share the joy and the good news of what Jesus has to offer. Let me pray with you today. Lord, we thank you so much for being our God, for being our Messiah, our Savior. Lord, we look forward to that day when you give back the land, referring to the Jubilee. This old world will be destroyed and you'll make it all new. And the inheritance will pass to us. Perfectly recreated, with sin completely removed. Lord, we look forward to that day. We recognize that we are sinners in need of your grace. So please fulfill your mission in our behalf today. Lord, we also ask that you would give us a mission. That you would show us how we fit in as your co-laborers that we could experience the joy along with others as they come to Jesus, as they come to you and give their lives to you. It is your mission, and it is our mission. In Jesus, we accept it. Help us as we go today to be safe in this storm. And Lord, help us to have the peace that passes understanding, the joy of your salvation. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all for joining us for our live stream today. Be signing off at this point and look forward to being back here in person next Sabbath as normal as there is no storm on the forecast. Happy Sabbath. Thank you for joining us. If you would like to learn about the opportunities available through Forest Park Seventh-day Adventist Church, such as Outreach, Service, and Forest Park Adventist Christian School, visit this website. If you are in our area, we would be delighted to have you worship with us at this address, 